call black everything Everything black, culture over everything Y'all, we taking it back, black Welcome to Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We are here in the John Hope Franklin Center at Duke University, where we are celebrating the centennial of John Hope Franklin's birth this year. We are happily and, and uh, excitedly joined today in studio by Ron K. Brown, founder and choreographer of Evidence Dance Company, which is celebrating its 30th anniversary this year. Mm -hmm. And we're also joined by Grammy Award nominated and, and just an all around great <laughs> musician and ambassador for jazz music, Jason Moran. Uh, Jason and Ron are in residence this week here at Duke uh, doing a performance of The Subtle One, yes. uh, which is their collaboration. And, and let's start there. Um, talk about how the collaboration came together. Mm -hmm. So uh, several years ago, Jason and I uh, met. I had known, met his wife, Alicia Moran. And we started a conversation about uh, him asking me this is my memory of it. Uh, why don't uh, dancers understand that dance and jazz belong together? I said, oh no, I understand that. I've worked with Oliver Lake, a world saxophone quartet, a piece of uh, One Shot with the music of Ahmad Jamal, Mary Lee Williams. Mm -hmm. He said, have you worked with Ahmad Jamal? I said, no, no. He said, wouldn't it be great if you did it uh, live with him? And then the brother gave me a CD. That's my memory of <laughs> what, what, what CD was it? Ten. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I... Um, and so when I have music, I have to um, digest it. So yeah. I've had it for some years and listen, listening for when the right moment was going to come and what the selections would be. I just finished a piece on the Al Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. And I love working with Ailey. It was my fifth piece for them. And I was like, oh, I can't wait to work with Evidence. The next day, after I finished with Four Corners, yeah. I yeah. went to the studio and worked on the subtle. And Jason, uh, were you excited about joining in? <laughs> Well, always. I mean, you know, I feel like I built a lot of my, I would say my career off of trying to find the mm -hmm. other relationships mm -hmm. that I thought mm -hmm. would prod mm -hmm. me and pull me. Um, so not only the ones that happened in the jazz clubs, but the ones that happened on various stages of all different types. And working with dance is not one that I've been, you know, it's every once in a while I get the opportunity to. So anytime that, you know, especially someone like Ron, kind of opens the door and says, oh, you know, I have something that I've done with your music. It's like you know, phenomenal. So this is a real, it's a real treat. And, and it really represents a kind of opportunity. Um, you know, obviously when you think about figures like Alvin Ailey and Duke Ellington, they clearly were aware of each other's art mm -hmm. um, and, and in all kinds of ways borrowed from it. I, I remember Mir Baraka writing um, in one of his books about, you know, just wondering how many, for instance, artists outside of, of music, mm -hmm. visual artists, dance artists, were just impacted by the sound of, of Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. It seems like these kind of collaborative practices are things that are, are getting lost more broadly mm -hmm. in black culture, you know, in part because everything is so driven by what's commercially accessible, right. what folks see on TV, what folks are hearing on the radio. Um, what kind of opportunity do you think this presents for the both of you in terms of thinking about charting more collaborative opportunities going forward? Uh, for me, the uh, amazing thing is I think in contemporary dance, sometimes the artists are about the structure um, and they want to use sound and music as something ambient. Yeah. Like something <laughs> I'm not going to deal with. <laughs> right. Right. And I think it's uh, to show their craft or um, and I think in some ways they might be intimidated, right? Because if you listen to this music, it's like, oh, where is it? Mm. Right? But I love music and respect music, right? And so I'm like, oh, this gives me an opportunity to um, increase my craft, <laughs> right? Show the musicality that I understand. Yeah. Right? That, you know, and not, um, and show the relationship and the marriage and the importance of them belonging together. And not that, oh, my dance is over here and music is over there secondary. You're watching Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony. We're joined today by Ron K. Brown, choreographer and founder of Evidence Dance Company, celebrating its 30th year. We're also joined by Jason Moran, whose latest recording is All Rise, which is a celebration and elegy for the music of Fats Waller. Um, Ron, I want to ask you about, you know, thinking about this 30th anniversary mm -hmm. and, and where black dance was in 1985. Oh. Um, and, and given all the kind of restrictions, right? I mean, right. you're talking about a moment where 
for young folks, the only thing you know is, is Alvin Ailey and Arthur Mitchell, <laughs> right? You, you have no idea, you know, we don't even, you know, there's no YouTube to pull up, you know, Catherine Dunham or, right. any, or any of those kind of things. You know, what have been kind of the changes and the shifts since you began in 1985 to where it is in 2015? Right, so the, in the early 80s, there's an artist, Trisha Brown, mm -hmm. incredible choreographer. In the history of modern dance, there was a, a like the traditional modern dance, right? Yeah. Um, Martha Graham, Ernest Cunningham, but yeah, a lot of right. those folks were right. getting injured, right? And so then, because to take care of their bodies, people kind of went to this kind of postmodern, postmodern yeah. dance, which is trying to discover the facility in their body absent of emotion. And so it's called the Alexander technique or the release technique, right? Yeah. So all, all of a sudden you have people moving, but it was like, a kind of indifference and aloof, right? And I was like, uh, I don't get it, right? As a black man, I was like, in the second grade, when I saw Ailey, I was like, oh, <laughs> dance is about telling stories, right? Mm -hmm. right. I studied composition right. and the teachers were like, right. oh, you can't use music with words, mm -hmm. um, follow the music, but only use classical music. I mean, these are the things you're being right. told, right? And so I'm looking, going to see work, because I'm like, I know I want to make work, but what is it? And I had worked with um, studying at Mary Anthony Dance Studio, mm -hmm. traditional old modern dance, and I was doing this piece about farmers, this plow movement. Guy over here, it was like not three of us, these men doing this plow movement. And then I was like, man, you gotta look at me. He said, oh, when they made this piece in 1966, they never looked at each other. And I was like, what? I thought this was modern dance about people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, 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 right. right. Yeah. So, I realized I, ne I needed to start a dance company, but a big brother, I was like, I think I just, I know I just started learning how to dance, but I don't see real people on stage. Mr. Ailey showed me that I could do this, mm -hmm. and I think I have to. And he said, who is going to tell your grandmother's stories? Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, that's, so I- That's incredible. So right, right, yeah. so I started the company Evidence, but still like this, um, oh, so I'm learning, trying to tell stories, the gestures, right? Remember we were in Canada, got a review. I was like, oh, another slave story. I was like, okay, this is okay. It wasn't about slavery, but yeah. but this was, I was like, oh no, but in the 30s, people were still looking at concert dance made by black people saying, what are they doing? This does not belong on stage. Yeah. So I think in that time with hip hop and um, dance, all these different dance shows, I think it has opened up, but still it's this, um, tricks and um, circus, right? I have some friends working in Europe, they're like, we can't get any work unless we're doing hip hop or doing circus acts, right? So even though it has opened up, <laughs> it's a place of being able to tell stories about who we are, it still is kind of not so um, right. accepted. Hip hop and universe soul. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, right. It's like that. That's the only, all these spaces. <laughs> Um, and, and then you could almost hear the critics, you know, when they look at those spaces, like, it's like there's too much body, mm -hmm. right? There's oh, too much movement, right? right. They, um, you know, which is an interesting kind of even comment about just the fear of black bodies in general in the right. arts world, particularly around movement. You know, we've had Camille A. Brown on the show, you know, and she's talked about, you know, when she was coming up and, mm -hmm. and you know, Camille's a, a small woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but even in that context, you know, she's talking about folks are kind of policing her size and her right. body because, you know, she didn't look like mm -hmm. uh, Misty Copeland, right? right? We had those same kind of conversations about her. Jason, your latest release, you know, Fats Waller, Fats Waller, of course, is a, is a giant. Mm -hmm. and, but, you know, when we talk about jazz pianists, you know, we talk about Ellington. You know, our, our good friend Guthrie Rod Ramsey has this great new book out on Bud Powell, you know. So we think about kind of the intellectual tradition of jazz playing. Mm -hmm. You know, Waller is kind of like a different kind of figure, right? We don't right. think about him as this kind of technician. Mm -hmm. We almost think about more of him in a kind of honky-tonk mm -hmm. blues realm as opposed to a jazz artist. What drew you to... That's Waller. Well, I mean, also he's 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 one of the he's the last of a breed. He's mm -hmm. at this cusp of you know, like post you know uh, minstrel shows like all those. The stride pianists, on. right? So he's right at the yeah. end of that. He's also at this point where he's trying to dissect who he is as a performer uh, and as a you know with wild eyebrows and eyes and these you know witty songs you know about that go from the high to the low, you know. Yeah. 
And uh, but if I strip all that away and just even look at his pianism, you know, and the people he learned from in Harlem, you know, James P. Johnson and right. Lyons, so well, yeah, he yeah, got yeah, laid yeah. some keys that and was able to take it to another dimension. I mean, Duke Ellington did not sing. And, you know, Willie Lion Smith did sing, but nobody sang like Fats Waller. Waller yeah. you know, Fats <laughs> Waller kind of, I, he's one of those singers I, I, that I think of that gives men hope that they could sing. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> he almost, he sings in a way that's so casual that you're like, oh, my voice could fit in that. It, it, it makes you think that, you know, early Nat King Cole, you know, mm -hmm. when he's Nat, in that Cole trio, that, yeah. that, that he clearly is influenced by someone like Fats Waller yeah. when he decides to give up the piano yeah. and then just become a vocalist. Or. You know, I was just watching part of a documentary about Fats, and Fats' son is recounting a concert that Fats Waller gave at Carnegie Hall when he decided... Fats Waller decided not to do any shucking job, decided not to sing any of his famous songs, decided only to play the piano. And people are yelling from the audience, oh, you know, play Ain't Misbehaving, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And he was like, no, I'm just playing the piano. And they just, they, they slammed him. They slammed him as a, as a, as a pianist. But, but he's remarkable. It, it raises, I think, important questions about those generations of both musicians and, and dancers. Um, when you think about Armstrong, right, you mentioned Fats Waller. Um, you know, Ellington and Miles Davis kind of got away from this, but, you know, they always had to see themselves as performers. Mm. You know, when we think about black dance, you know, for most folks, it's tap dance, mm -hmm. right? And we're thinking about the Sammy Davis Juniors and and Sandman Sims and all those kinds of folks, right? right? And, and we never see the craft mm -hmm. behind mm -hmm. the performative aspects, mm -hmm. right? You know, the entertaining for the public, particularly white publics. Mm -hmm. We never actually talk seriously about the craft of what they were doing, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Louis Armstrong was a genius, mm -hmm. right? But all we remember is Hello, Dolly. <laughs> right. Yeah, that, it, that, I mean, this also, this is one of the reasons of addressing Fats Waller is to actually, uh, the way the record starts is with a, a tribute to DJ Screw in Houston, yeah, where yeah, I'm from. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, a, yeah. And this, this little thing called Put Your Hands On. Yeah, you know, yeah. And I think of Fats Waller and I think of history as in this way where you have to constantly be touching it to make sure it hasn't gone too cold. Mm. You have to give it some warmth, yeah. you know, to make sure it's still yeah. there. But yeah. it's also a thing that you, and, and to play that material, you have to feel it. You know, you learn an alien piece, you have to feel it in your body, mm -hmm. revelations in your body, you know, uh, and it continues to change for generation to generation because our relationship to our body continues to change. You know, the clothes we wear decide how our, our body yeah. feels. So, yeah. so I want to touch those, those histories, especially those related to especially jazz piano because they hold certain keys that right now, you know, I know a lot of my peers would never decide, decide to look at Fats Waller for right. whatever reasons, yeah. you know? Uh, but this is the work that I've kind of dedicated my life to. How much were you impacted when you were young when Ain't Misbehaving was on Broadway? I, I think there's a whole generation of folks that were introduced to Fats Waller in that context. So. Yeah, you know, you know, I think it was my, I would like to tell the story of learning certain jazz songs when I was a teenager. Yeah. And when I played Ain't Misbehaving, my grandmother was like, <laughs> you know, kind of she, like, oh, she boy, took an you know that? You she know? took an <laughs> You know, like a chain, like we realized, like, okay, this song holds weight in certain, you know, certain, certain generations, uh, you know, and it was, that, but that's how I kind of started to yeah. realize how yeah. powerful he was. You're watching Left to Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're here at the John Hope Franklin Center, joined today in studio. Jason Moran, uh, recently his album All Rise, which is an elegy for Fat Waller. We're also joined by Ron K. Brown, choreographer and founder of Evidence. The two are here in residence at Duke, uh, performing their collaborative effort, The Subtle One. Uh, Jason will be here with his band, Bandwagon. Um, we talked a little bit, uh, you know, I had the privilege of having the both of you um, address my class, you know, this week. And, you know, we talked about the state of the arts in America, right? Not just black arts, which is the state of arts in, in general. Um, how difficult it is, you know, to find the resources to continue to sustain, sustain, you know, arts innovation. You know, in part, residencies like the ones that you're doing now are so important, mm -hmm. right? You know, because for working artists, you know, it, it actually gives you an opportunity to sit down and think and, and do the work. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder, and, and it, it goes back to the point that you just made, Ron, about telling the stories of your grandmother, mm -hmm. you know, through dance. 
I always worry that, you know, some of the things that have made us matter as artists, mm -hmm. thinkers, you know, how do we sustain it in a way that 40 years from now, folks will still be talking about a fat swallower. Mm -hmm. You know, the folks will still know who Alvin Ailey is. Right. You know, my father was a, a huge fan of gospel quartets mm -hmm. and quintets. Oh, yeah. Mighty Clouds of Joy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I, when I was young, I, I wanted to almost just join a church just to be able to set up uh, yeah. one of these quartets right. because I understood what that tradition meant to my father, right? right? But when I turn on, you know, the BET gospel show or this kind of gospel show, I don't see those groups anymore. Right. You know, Joe Lagan's not going to be walking this earth for, <laughs> for another hundred years. Mm -hmm. So I worry about how we sustain these traditions going forward, particularly for our folks. Right. That's, that's amazing. I think um, we have to not let it go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So my grandfather in Ripon, North Carolina, whenever I was down there, we were going to see Quartets at the school, right? And so when I started my company, right, I was using quartets. Yeah, <laughs> wow. Right? And so then my grandfather, Ruben McFadgen, when he would see the book, he in the Q and A, he was like, "That's right, Kevin, keep God first. Right? Wow. And so my nephew, who's ten years old, he's like, "I'm gonna dance. I wanna have five jobs like you, Uncle." Right? And, so, <laughs> <laughs> and then he's asking me, "So who are these people in the family?" Right? And so we have to keep telling the generations who we are, who they were, because we are still those people. Yeah. And so in all the classes, I'm always saying this. So one, our ancestors are watching us, in us. We are them. Yeah. Yeah. And so we have to be conscious of that all of the time. Right? So don't disrespect the ones that are up there or the ones right who are right there. Yeah. Right? And so that's the responsibility that we have as artists and as people. And for me, I just let people know there's no separation. Please. <laughs> that's a sensibility also that I, that's not common curriculum at universities. <laughs> you know, they, you learn that at your house. You know, or you know, you figure out you want to learn it at your house. Or, you know, um, I would tell students that they should only be working with people that they can actually eat dinner with, not like people who can just make good music. Mm -hmm. But you have to spend more time on the road with musicians traveling together and mm -hmm. eating together, and you get like an hour and a half on stage with them. But then the rest of the time, you're just with this person. Right. You might be talking about music. Um, but that kind of, <clears throat> that part about maintaining a sense of self within the lineage, like my son was asking me, you know, like I wanna, I wanna live forever. I was like, you will. Cause he's like, how are you gonna live forever? I said, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you how I'm gonna live forever and your kids Cheers how forever. you know that's, that's our everlasting life. That for me is that, you know, watching you take whatever energy I have and then decide to distribute it in this other way. Pianists who Jackie Byard, Andrew Hill, you know, Thelonious Monk, uh, people who came and said, Jason, you know, this is the way. Right. Check that out. Now right. when Noah's was through the door. But I just think you should go over there. You know what I mean? And then I go over there, and they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And they watch me walk through the door, and then they say, keep going. Yeah. But they, they want, like, I mean, the music depends on that kind of like thrust forward, but also recognition for, for all the people that, you know, that I said yesterday in your class that wore the scars so yeah. that you could now yeah. maneuver the way that we maneuver. You had a wonderful opportunity recently, Jason, to score um, Selma. Uh, this, you know, really in many ways earth-shattering film about the movement in Selma, uh, Academy Award nomination uh, for the film, if not for Ava. Um, talk about what that moment was like, particularly in the context of, of this Black Lives Matter moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's powerful. I mean, to, that's putting it, you know, that's, that's an understatement. Uh, but Ava uh, was working on this last year and, and the cinematographer, Bradford Young, they were having a discussion one night and she was like, you know, I need somebody to, to help make this, make the sound for this. And Brad was like, you should call Jason. And, uh, and we talked on the phone and you know, and Ava's from Compton, we're around the same age. So that's some of our sensibilities about, but right. also about where, where hip hop falls in line with this. With larger, with, yeah. With, yeah. with where we are and then what that struggle was. And uh, so once I started to see the images, she would send me scenes and, and I would start to send her back music. And I just remember like the first scene we, 
I scored for her was the final scene, which is this remarkable speech. Yeah. And I sat playing it, and then I listened to it for about an hour and watched it and just cried for an hour. And wow. then I sent it to her and I said, Ava, I've been crying for an hour. I hope this is good. <laughs> and so she said, oh, Jason, I'm going to watch it right now. And she watched it and she was crying. She called me back. She was like, let's, 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 let's go. You know, okay, now let's go through the rest of the movie because I don't know, you know, um, you know, like uh, uh, some friends have been saying, like the way that she portrays us, lets us be on the screen, right. is, is, is beautiful to watch. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, it's an act of love. Yeah. I, you know, I talk all the time about in that film, that kitchen scene early in the film where, mm -hmm. where they show mm -hmm. up and it's oh. like, it's just food and grits. And, <laughs> yeah, right, you know, right. we, we've yeah. never seen yeah. consistently those kind of images of right. ourselves, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. right, yeah. on yeah. the screen. Which we know really well. <laughs> right, <exactly. laughs> but for you, Ron, also thinking about this, you know, as a choreographer and, and a dancer, you know, are, are you sitting there wondering how you calibrate your art going forward, you know, in consideration of this energy, you know, mm -hmm. that's suddenly going through right. the culture. You know, it's, um, uh, I talk a lot about being o obedient, like <laughs> hearing information <laughs> right. and, and being obedient. I'm doing this project at the Williams College, talking to one of the chaplains, he said, oh, that's great, but students aren't, they may flinch around that word, right? And so, but, when you are obedient, it's amazing how it unfolds. Yeah. We, are, we are, are in New York season at the Joyce, we open up next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. There's a men's duet to a Dr. King speech, mm. right? But I have two women doing, hey, incredible. Yeah. And then I, was, I taught it to a student at the Ailey School and um, very senior project, right? And she was like, oh, Oh, I'm from South Africa, but I don't know, I had this opportunity in my political science major. Thank you for this opportunity. Mm. And you know, I'm, so I'm talking to these women about how to connect to this piece about the value of a man's life. Yeah. And like, did you do this on purpose? Is this the time? I said, no, this is from 1995, mm. but I made this piece. Mm. And how do we connect to it? I said, look up Eleanor Bumpers. Yeah. Right. 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 And so this story is not brand new, right? right? And so look, look up with Kia Boyd and right, right. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's about being obedient, and then you see, okay, like, oh, right. it's right on time, Ron. I said, he told me, yes, I didn't just, I just follow. <laughs> <laughs> We've been joined in studio today, uh, wonderfully, uh, Ron K. Brown, choreographer and founder of Evidence Dance Company, celebrating its 30th year this year, 2015, and also Jason Moran. Uh, well-known, well-respected jazz pianist just recently scored uh, Selma, the Ava DuVernay film, uh, and they both have been in residence here at Duke University. Thank you both for joining us Thank today. You. Thank you. Black lights and boots burn when I record for Watts and every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot. All black everything, everything black, culture over everything.